first asked to come here and, and visit with Bill a little bit, we were talking about the, the cost of feed, and I think we identified yesterday that that's one of our main costs of production. And what I proposed was to discuss uh, some of the ways we can manage our nutrition program to both get the most value uh, in our operation for that money we spend on feed and some of the things we can do um, you know, as we formulate that feed and work with our suppliers and purchase that feed to uh, lower that cost. So I've kept the topic pretty broad, um, hoping for some interaction here. If you've got some questions or comments as we go, uh, feel free to speak up and uh, we'll see what we can cover. There we go. Uh, just a, a brief outline. Um, I think Dr. Sally Knoll talked a bit about distillers grains on Monday. Unfortunately, I, I missed her discussion. But uh, other than that, I haven't seen a whole lot of uh, nutrition on the agenda. So I'm going to try to cover uh, quite a, a broad spectrum here today. I want to start with feed manufacture. What are some of our options and pros and cons of those different options? Uh, feed handling. Um, how we handle that feed on the farm to make sure that it's, it's fresh and retains uh, the nutrients. And just a touch on nutrients and uh, considerations from nutrition. Then we'll talk about ingredients, what are our different options, and some of the pros and cons there, and what we can do with those ingredients through formulation, uh, especially on a cost uh, savings basis. Um, it was mentioned earlier that ethanol production is going to take more of our corn this year than livestock feed, and that's huge. That's especially huge if we don't get enough rain this year. Uh, we were fairly short on corn last year. Um, we haven't had a bad drought for quite a while. So um, if, our, if our corn crop um, isn't excellent each year going forward, um, we might not have enough corn in this country. And then some of the ways you can evaluate your nutrition program to know that that's working for you and getting done what you expect it to get done. So feed manufacture, I broke this up into three different options. Uh, basically, you can purchase complete feed. Uh, you can purchase some sort of base mix that you then blend with a few ingredients on your farm. Or you could just go all out and make your own feed. Uh, I get the impression from visiting with people here that most of you are purchasing a complete feed um, in some capacity or another. So if we purchase complete feed, oh, excuse me, um, I've got two, two different bullets here. Um, you can purchase what I'd say would be a standard off the shelf, um, your local tractor supply, farm store uh, type of feed. It's probably going to be adequate. Um, if you only need a small quantity, it's probably going to be your best option. Um, by and large, it's going to be overformulated. That's made for a wide range of different situations, different producers, different birds. Um, they've made that for everything. And so they've probably overshot the mark and, and put more in it than what you might need. Uh, the other option would be to get a custom formula made at a toll mill. So um, whether it's your nutritionist or their nutritionist, but you have your own formula um, made at their mill. This allows you to uh, specify what that formula looks like based on your needs and the goals of your operation. There's a lot of uh, management that goes into operating a feed mill and inventorying ingredients. So if you hire someone else to make this feed, you take that responsibility off of your business. And that's... Uh, maybe one of the main reasons why uh, you're doing that right now. In some situations, there may be an option to use some of your own uh, grain. I don't know how many of you are also grain farmers, but if you produce some corn, um, you may be able to set up an arrangement with that mill where you would supply uh, corn to them and then essentially get that back uh, in your feed. Uh, that gives you another nice option to help manage your feed costs. The second option, which might be something to consider um, for some of your bigger producers, would be to purchase a base mix. This base mix would be essentially all the ingredients except probably the corn and soybean meal. So if you had the capability on your farm to uh, inventory and manage you know, just a few key ingredients, 
then you could purchase that base mix. Then you don't have to transport all that corn and soybean meal. You can buy it yourself and manage uh, some of the costs there. Yet you don't have to run a, a full-fledged feed mill with you know, a dozen different ingredients. A few considerations there is what equipment you have. That, that equipment would be um, adequate to accu accurately measure the ingredients. Um, I've got one guy who admitted to me that he was scooping things up in a loader bucket and it was one loader bucket or two loader buckets. Well, <laughs> ideally we'd be able to fine tune that uh, a, a bit more. Uh, another consideration is ingredient storage. If you're going to keep the corn and soybean meal on farm, do you have um, adequate bin space and uh, the capability to keep those ingredients uh, from spoiling? And in a situation like this, you'd pretty much just be uh, mash feed. Uh, perhaps you'd have a grinder there on the farm. Um, at, this, uh, at this point, you wouldn't have enough capacity to make pelleted feed. So depending on the importance of pelleted feed to your operation, um, might knock, knock this off as an option. And the third option I've got here is to manufacture your own feed. And I feel like there probably isn't anybody in the room that's completely making their own feed. Is that an accurate assessment? Are you making your own feed? Okay. Um, that really gives you a lot more opportunities to manage that cost yourself. Um, from, from control over purchasing, to uh, actually how that feed's being made. If you're doing it yourself, you know exactly what's going in the mixer. Um, you've hired those people, and you, you know them and can trust them. Um, you also have control over firing them if they don't do what you want. A um, couple considerations if you're going to run your own mill is that you have enough capacity to move ingredients and, and keep things fresh. So... Um, you know, turning over inventory in a timely manner, especially your, your vitamins and uh, products that might not have as long a shelf life or stability. And you can also have essentially immediate delivery to the birds if you've got it right there. So you don't have any delay between manufacture and, and actually feeding. Another consideration is, is bin space that you have for alternate ingredients. Uh, in the formulation section here, I'll go into what are some of the savings we can realize by using different ingredients. Um, if your mill's limited to only a few basics, uh, some of those opportunities may not be available to you without um, constructing or, or putting up another bin. That does mean that you have the staffing management and quality control um, both on the positive side, you, you've got control over the situation, um, that's also another, another big piece to add to your business. Another consideration, if you're going to manufacture your own feed but you don't quite have enough um, volume to, to calculate that out, are there other producers in your same area that you might be able to work with and uh, sell some feed to them? Uh, the second thing I wanted to go into was feed handling. Um, just how, how we handle this feed on the farm to make sure that um, you know, we, we've paid a lot of money for this stuff. So we want to make sure we take care of it and that, that our birds can get everything from it. Observe the label. That label is probably uh, going to indicate a shelf life. Uh, typically on a complete feed that's going to be, I'd say, three to six months. So do what you can to make sure that you buy that feed and use it and, and get it gone within that uh, recommended shelf life because there are um, perhaps enzymes in that feed, uh, vitamins in that feed that uh, that's the, the vitamins and phytase here I've listed that will actually lose some of their potency and um, over time that complete feed, especially you know, once a feed is ground, that exposes all of the surface area of those grains to mold and mycotoxins. Uh, that's going to be especially important in the summer when it's hot and when it's damp. So here I've got make sure that, um, you know, you're properly storing this feed uh, away from, from heat and moisture as much as you can, and rodents. You know, make sure your feed shed, feed bins, 
You know, there's not a bunch of mice and rats running around there. Check the feed delivery system for holes, leaks, and build up feed. Um, that's where you're going to have moisture coming in. Um, when, I, when I refer to the feed delivery system, the bins, the trucks, the augers, the feeders, the, the entire system. Um, you have a water leak in a bin somewhere, that feed's going to get wet and it's going to cake up in there. So, you know, look in those bulk bins, um, look in those trucks, make sure there's not globs of stuff stuck in there because that's where you're going to find your mycotoxins and those globs of stuff are going to slough off and, uh, and run through. I had uh, one place where they were having problems with, with chunks getting stuck in their feeding system and they, they were after suppliers and, and every place else they couldn't figure out where these chunks were coming from. Well, it turns out they had a tear in an ingredient bin up on the roof. And so all the water from the roof was running right down into that hole and it was making these big uh, pieces. And uh, so that's why it's important to just acknowledge all these different places where, uh, where especially you can get moisture. And then uh, just different packaging options for uh, getting that feed if you are purchasing a complete feed. Um, you can get it in bulk, obviously in a truck, if you've got quantity sufficient enough to do that. You could get it in 2,000 pound totes. Um, which would require a, a bit of a different feed handling system, or you can get it bagged. Um, obviously, bagged is going to add a bit of expense because you've got to pay for the bags. Uh, if you're not buying a lot of feed, that's probably going to be the easiest, uh, which for convenience sake would offset the extra cost. I just wanted to touch a little bit on nutrients. Um, I was charged with talking about you know, saving feed costs, and I feel like a big part of that is, is managing our feed so that it's the best that it can be. Um, I'm not going to give you an entire lecture on nutrition, but I just wanted to touch on a few of the basics uh, that we're looking for in a good feed. So I start with amino acids. Uh, typically on our label, it's listed protein, and often... Um, feeds will be formulated to a certain protein level, rather that's 18, 20, 22%. Protein is made up of amino acids, and that's both in the feed and in the body. So the birds actually need amino acids, not protein. Does that make sense? Uh, those amino acids are required for synthesis of uh, all your protein in the body, your muscle, eggs, feathers, and so forth. Growth, or you know, synthesis of any of these um, different proteins in the body, is limited by your first limiting amino acid. And um, I've got a, a diagram on the next slide. We get most of these amino acids from our soybean meal, our meat and bone meal, um, other high protein ingredients such as canola meal, alfalfa meal, um, you know, those type of ingredients are going to be supplying most of the protein uh, to your formula. All right, this is about the extent of my nutrition lecture, so we'll see if we can make it through this guy here. Um, when we formulate diets, we typically formulate them on amino acids rather than protein. And if that diet is is deficient. If it doesn't contain everything that bird needs to, you know, whether it's grow, lay eggs, um, that is limited by uh, the most limiting amino acid. So if you look at, at this one on the left, that's methionine. Is, is indicated by this stave on the barrel is the lowest one. If it's broken, that's all the higher you can put water in that barrel. And that's analogous to if, if that amino acid is limiting, that's all the more production you can get from that diet. Regardless of how much of the other amino acids are in there, you know, this, this stave over here can, can be clear up to here, and your barrel's only going to hold that much water. If we can move that up to this level, as you can see on the right, then our barrel can hold more water. So in our diet, if we can move this one amino acid up, then we can get a higher level of production. 
the significance of this, the protein in an animal has a certain makeup of amino acids. It's got a certain amount of methionine, lysine, threonine in different proportions, like you see the different lengths on this barrel. That's not the same that you're going to find in your corn and soybean meal in your feed. So typically in your feed, your methionine is going to be relatively low compared to what would be in your birds. In order to compensate for that, what we do in poultry formulas is we add methionine. We actually have synthetic methionine as a separate ingredient that we can add. If we didn't have, if we didn't have that as an option, we'd have to add that much more protein supplying ingredients, which would essentially be uh, an added expense in that feed. So we added this methionine, which was able to bring our water level, our, our production, up to a higher uh, plane here. Now methionine and lysine are limiting our production, and threonine is the next one. So hypothetically, if I had an, another picture of a barrel and we fortified the diets a bit more, we'd add this bit of methionine and this bit of lysine, and we'd be here and we'd move that water up a little bit more. Now interestingly, if we, if we get a little more uh, in depth, we actually have methionine, lysine, and threonine available as separate feed ingredients. So we can actually get to the point where we're adding all of these up to our third stave, and if you look back here, um, and it depends on what bird you're talking about, what system, it's, it's gonna be probably one of these three, but in this picture, it's valine. So if you added methionine, lysine, and threonine, you'd get to this level. So that's, that's kind of the basics of uh, how we formulate diets and, and uh, utilize some of our synthetic amino acids. And then save money because we don't have to use soybean meal to meet all of those requirements. A little touch on vitamins and minerals. Um, Maybe I should have introduced myself a little more. Um, I, I work for a company called Aki Nutrition, and Aki Nutrition is primary in vitamin and mineral premix manufacturing. And so we have a couple different uh, production facilities across the country where we blend vitamin and mineral premixes for different classes of livestock and poultry. And then you know, with those, uh, we provide our, our nutrition and formulation services. So vitamins and minerals, as we're probably aware, are necessary for a lot of the metabolic functions uh, that occur in most, uh, most of our uh, animals. And they're, they're supplied by this vitamin and trace mineral premix. Now, if you were to do a base mix, that would, would already be included. Um, typically, the, this premix would be, you know, our, our really big integrators might be down to two to three pounds per ton inclusion on up to about 50 would be a, a good range. Uh, as we put the vitamins and trace minerals together into one, um, some of them tend to not interact very well together, so your stability of that product is relatively short. Uh, typically, we recommend within three months, and that date should be you know, stamped on the bag. And those are formulated for the specific class of animal that you're feeding. Um, for example, in our system, we make hundreds of different premixes. Energy. Um, energy is required for growth and maintenance. To a certain extent, it's going to influence feed consumption. Um, really, energy and sodium are about the only two things in your formula that are really going to influence feed consumption. Birds will tend to eat to meet their energy needs, so if you have a higher energy diet, they will tend to eat less of it. It's, it's not an exact correlation, but, but it's close. The energy in our formulas comes primarily in the form of carbohydrates from your grains, um, corn, wheat, and so forth, uh, from your fat, which would be your ven vegetable oil, or uh, blended fat. A lot of times you can get an animal vegetable blend or um, some byproduct of the restaurant industry, 
um, what yesterday's french fries were cooked in. And as a general rule, your high protein ingredients, um, your soybean meal, are going to be lower in energy. Uh, the exception to that is, is meat and bone, because that is going to contain a fair amount of fat. And then I just put kind of a laundry list of different ingredients that, that may be available when we consider formulation. Um, as a nutritionist, we want to put together a diet. The first thing we have to ask ourselves is, what is available? So we've got corn and bean meal, probably the, the predominant um, ingredients in most of our poultry and livestock feeds here in the U.S. Uh, wheat, oats, and barley, uh, to a lesser extent, um, here, definitely more important in different parts of the world. Uh, meat and bone meal uh, can be uh, quite valuable in formulas. Uh, I don't know, are, are you guys putting meat in diets? Yes? Yes? Okay. Uh, distillers grains, I mean, we're all pretty aware that they exist. Um, they exist in pretty big quantities and for the most part they can offer a pretty decent savings. Uh, some other things here, canola might show up now and again, different uh, areas geographically, um, your fatter oil to provide energy. A bakery byproduct is typically overrun startups, expired, you know, so forth from bread, cookies, donuts, um, different food systems. So that's going to primarily be an energy source. Uh, can carry quite a bit of sodium with it, uh, depending on, you know, if it's potato chips um, versus donuts. Uh, alfalfa meal, wheat middlings, and soy hulls, those are going to be your high fiber ingredients. Um, those are going to uh, tend to lower the energy content of the diet. Uh, if, if you're pelleting feeds, uh, wheat mids will have some value to uh, make a better pellet. Uh, continuing with our list of ingredients, uh, limestone is used as a source of calcium. Um, in egg production, historically, uh, oyster shells have been used, but oyster shells tend to be uh, fairly expensive, so we've found that using a, a larger sized limestone particle will get the same effects with regards to shell quality. Dicalcium and monocalcium phosphate are um, ingredients to supply phosphorus in the diet. Here's our crystalline amino acids, primarily methionine, to a certain extent lysine, and now we have feed grade threonine available. Um, probably won't find that in any of your diets. Uh, salt is fairly self-explanatory. Our vitamin premix, again, any medications that we, we need to include in that feed. Um, grit, mycotoxin binders, if we've got some known mycotoxin contamination in our grains coming in. Um, sometimes we'll use those in a feed that we know is going to be around for a while and you might get a little spoilage going on before that's actually consumed. Uh, probiotics uh, to help with uh, intestinal health. Enzymes, and under the enzyme category I have phytase. Phytase actually releases some of the phosphorus from plant sources. So a fair amount of the phosphorus in especially our corn is bound in an insoluble matrix that is uh, broken down by phytase. Um, that's pretty widely accepted in uh, poultry formulas today. Carbohydrates are enzymes that break down the fiber fraction of a feed and allow the bird to get more energy uh, from that same feed. Um, we're seeing more carbohydrates use in poultry formulas today, um, certainly not to the extent of phytase. And the last one I listed here was protease, and that helps the bird get more amino acids from a diet. Um, proteases of the three are definitely the, the newest player. And then there's a whole host of other additives. Um, as you may be aware, um, there's lots of people selling lots of different additives for, for different purposes. Any other ingredients? We got fish meal. 
Anybody have a favorite one they couldn't live without? All right. I've got this listed as ingredient quality control. A lot of this is applicable to complete feed if you don't necessarily have control over your ingredients. If you are buying a complete feed, um, you have every right to visit with the person that's making that feed and, and see what uh, their quality control program is. So you have a little better idea what you're getting. Um, you know, get in there and start asking some questions and they'll know that you're paying attention. And when I was putting this together and I got to thinking about it, I, I thought, well, I might leave these people with more questions than answers. And then I realized that's not all bad. You know, go out there and ask those questions and, and really know what you're getting in that feed that you're spending so much money for. So know and trust your suppliers. Um, this is both suppliers of products and services. Um, you should know these people. They're part of your team. Um, a lot of our big integrators have hired these people onto their staff if they have their own nutritionist, their own feed mill. Um, if you don't have the capability to do that yourself and you have to hire somebody else to do it, they're still part of your team. And you want them understanding your needs and you know, working for you. So know them, develop a trusting relationship, and ask lots of questions. They're going to be an incredible source of information. So um, you might as well utilize it. For the most part, avoid switching suppliers, um, especially for ingredients, and especially as we talk about using more byproducts. If we can stay with one, one production facility, one supplier, we're going to have more consistency there. And the final thing I put on here was recognize deals. If something seems too good to be true, it probably is. A big part of ingredient quality control and something that we really emphasize uh, with our customers is ingredient testing. We would prefer to do more, spend more of the money, time, and resources testing raw materials than complete feed because when we formulate a diet, we really need to know what those ingredients look like. Um, corn isn't corn. In different parts of the country, corn will have different uh, characteristics. So you know, get those sent to the lab and uh, determine what you've really got. If a nutritionist doesn't know what an ingredient is, you, know, you just say, well, I've got some corn and bean meal, and there's no more information included, they're going to put a, an insurance on top of that. So they're going to formulate a little extra into that feed to make sure that you've got enough. So if you analyze your ingredients and know what you've got, you can, you can cut a little bit out, which will take some, uh, some cost out. Uh, key times to analyze your ingredients after harvest. Um, different crop years tend to vary a fair amount. Um, once we get that crop harvested in the bin, we can usually characterize it um, a little better by crop year. If you do change suppliers, um, we typically recommend fairly routinely, you know, once or twice a month to just keep an eye on things. And I would recommend testing um, basically our approximate analysis, moisture, protein, fat, fiber, calcium, phosphorus, and sodium. And mycotoxins can be a concern. Uh, in 2009, we had uh, fairly high mycotoxin contamination in our corn uh, in different parts of the country. We've seen a little bit of it out there this year. Um, definitely regionally um, defined. So it's not a bad idea to, to run some mycotoxin screens. Just make sure we've got a good handle on that. A uh, little bit more about mycotoxins. Um, once mycotoxins are produced in a feed or a grain, they, they really can't be removed. So the best we can do is support that animal through that challenge, or even better, not use those ingredients in the first place. Uh, this can occur either in the field before that grain is harvested, or it can occur during storage. So if we start to get extra moisture, we start to keep our complete feed around too long, we can get some mycotoxins there, especially, as I said before, in ground feed. And mycotoxins really impair the immune function of the birds. So in a situation where those birds get a little challenge, 
and normally you wouldn't see anything. They'd, they'd really just cruise right on through that. If they've really been hit by a heavy mycotoxin load in the feed, um, that challenge that otherwise wouldn't have been a problem may manif manifest itself uh, a little more. And it's also going to decrease your nutrient absorption, uh, damage that intestinal lining that, that Dr. Porter talked about, and that also makes it easier for bacteria to uh, invade into the system. And uh, this graph that I've got here is actually from a trial that we did in-house with some of the corn in 2009. And this shows feed intake in turkey poults uh, to six weeks of age. So in these first four bars, I've got uh, clean feed, so 0% contaminated corn, and that was titrated up to 100% of the corn in the diet was our high mycotoxin corn. And you can see those birds backed off of feed linearly with each increasing level of mycotoxin, even at the first level, which calculated out to be about 3 ppm vomitoxin in the complete feed, those birds had already backed off. Um, I don't have the body weight gain graph up here, but it pretty much looks the same with, with a different axis on the side. These three bars on the right are different feed additives that we put back into this diet. So you can see, um, especially with, with this one labeled number one, we do have some options of additives to put in the feed that will help those birds through that challenge. Um, you can see that, that these birds ate more than their counterparts that didn't have the additive, uh, wasn't quite back up to the level of the clean feed. Uh, formulation. Uh, basically, the, the specific blend of ingredients that, that we're going to make into a complete feed. So, as I leave you with more questions today, who's responsible for formulating your diets? Hopefully, you all know that. Uh, what are the priorities for your business? I formulate feed for a lot of different people, and they all have different priorities. So, I don't have you know, this is Stacy's nutrition program. I mean, I have different, different programs for, for all different customers based on their priorities. And uh, the last one I put here is what is the tolerance or precision for measuring ingredients? There's no point in me putting one pound of something on a piece of paper and sending it to the feed mill if they can only measure five pounds. So I put a few examples in here. Um, I just want to emphasize that these are examples only. These aren't meant to be actual diets. Um, this is just for a little comparative exercise. And you know, what, what options do we have in formulation that can flat out save us some money? And uh, how much money could that be, hypothetically speaking? So if we look at some of these examples, um, I picked some fairly common ingredients. I assigned some fairly current prices to them, and I formulated to the same nutrient specifications. So this will be our, our reference diet. Um, like I said, it's not meant to, to represent a specific diet that was ever manufactured, but um, we've got our corn, our bean meal, our limestone, our monocal for calcium and phosphorus, um, 18 pounds of fat here for some energy. Others is our salt, our premix, um, other things that, that I didn't adjust in this exercise. I've got this here at, at $279.28. So that, that's going to be our reference and our starting point if these are the only ingredients that we used. And then what I've done is I've gone through and, and just run some different scenarios. What if I used you know, this ingredient or that ingredient? Uh, how much does that save in this formula? So here I added 100 pounds of distillers. That's a fairly safe level, fairly low level, uh, especially in a grower diet. Um, 100 pounds of distillers, uh, if you compare across here, is going to replace about 50 pounds of corn, about 50 pounds of bean meal. So roughly, if you want some rules of thumb in your head, it's, it's going to be about half corn and half bean meal. Uh, we'll see some, a little bit of adjustments here. Uh, it does require a little bit of extra fat. And... Uh, there's our 100 pounds of distillers. We saved $1.73 per ton. So that's where I come back to you. I've got your goals in mind. What does $1.73 per ton mean to you? Yes, no, are you interested? That, that's your call at this point. Well, what if we had 200 pounds? 
100 pounds is good, 200 pounds must be better. Um, we get a similar comparison here. We're, we're about uh, half corn, half bean meal. Uh, we bumped our fat up a little more, and we saved $3.16. Are we more interested? Maybe? All right, so that's, that's the savings that we can, can see with distillers. That's on today's prices. Um, tomorrow that might change. That's why that relationship with your nutritionist is so important to, to check these pretty often. Uh, what other options do we have? How about 100 pounds of meat and bone? We know meat and bone supplies energy, protein, calcium, and phosphorus. So it's a pretty good ingredient. Um, you can see here we've got higher corn, lower bean meal. Look what we did to our limestone and our monocal. Um, we really dropped those down because this 100 pounds of meat brings a lot of calcium and phosphorus with it. Uh, we completely cut our fat out of this diet, and uh, we've actually got a little bit of wheat middlings because we didn't need any more energy. We saved $11.53. That sounds pretty good. Energy enzyme. That was one of the ingredients I had up there in our ingredient list was that we could include energy enzymes to get more energy out of this same diet. Again, I went back to our reference. So we've got all the distillers out. We've got all the meat out. We're back to this reference. Um, we took all of our fat out. And we had some adjustment in, in corn and bean meal, not huge. In this example, I saved $4.38. So I'm just trying to get you a feel for what some of these different ingredients mean um, in a formula. Well, what if we do the whole shebang? You came to me and said, by golly, Stacy, I've got to have the cheapest feed I can. Um, and I'm... I'm sticking with these nutrient specs. I say, you know, this is what we've got to have nutritionally. So we added our 100 pounds of distillers, 100 pounds of meat, and our energy enzyme. So we actually lost all the monocal, um, about half of the limestone, a good piece of the soybean meal, and we've saved almost $16. So you can kind of get a feel for, for some of the impact of, of some of these. And I'm afraid I'm pushing my time limit here. I wanted to just go through a couple things in how to evaluate your nutrition program. Um, look at the birds. They'll tell you if, if you're getting what you need. Um, adequate muscling is mainly driven by protein, amino acids, and uh, fat pad. You know, when you open up the birds, is, is there some, some fat there? Is mainly energy. Um, you look here, you know, this bird hadn't eaten much for a long time, and you can see the, the muscling on this bird looks a lot nicer. If you start to see mouth lesions, um, that could be mycotoxins, could be a particle size issue. Um, typically, you'll see mouth lesions in older birds before you'll see them in younger birds. Uh, this picture I've got here, um, this hen has a pretty good mouth lesion right there. You'll see those right along the edge of the upper beak and right along the edge, kind of under the tongue on the lower beak. Um, basically, that's like a, like a canker sore you might get in your mouth. Uh, if you see skeletal or bone abnormalities, that's typically calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D. Um, this is a laying hen, so obviously she's got a pretty high calcium demand. And you can see um, what's happened to this keel bone when she didn't have enough calcium to support that egg production. That'll get a, a big S shape in it. And then look at the droppings. Um, are they loose? Do they have diarrhea? Is there um, feed particles still in the manure uh, indicating that you're getting incomplete digestion or that you have uh, some health problems going on there? Again, send feed samples to the lab. Even if you're not making your own feed, you probably have an idea what you're expecting in it. Send it to the lab. Does it look like what you expected? Um, there's plenty of labs around here that'll, that'll test that and uh, see if you're getting what you're paying for. Uh, smell it. If, it. if it doesn't smell good, birds probably don't want to eat it either. And visually, is it, is it uniform? Is it free of clumps, bugs, and does it look like the last feed you got? Uh, in this example, you can see there, there's a piece there. If you pick that, that chunk up and, and kind of break it apart, you can see that that's the fat. So the fat application system wasn't working right in this situation. So when you add that fat to the complete feed, there's, there's one chunk of it here and 
not very much of it here. Um, so you might get on the phone and start calling some people. And economical. You know, work closely with your suppliers, your nutritionist, uh, the feed mill, and you know, check those uh, formulas with current prices. Uh, feed ingredient prices change every day. And so the best formula solution from six months ago might not be the same best formula solution today. And I just put in some summaries um, just covering what we did before, different options for feed manufacture and considerations for feed handling, and this is all in your handouts. I intended that to be more of a reference um, you can go back to and you know, consider what ingredients are available and uh, what options you have with regards to byproducts. And this is me at the top of the Bighorn Mountains last summer out in Wyoming. Uh, Sheridan's way back here in the background. So I grew up in Iowa. I live in Ohio, so the mountains are kind of a big deal to me.